Subcommittee on Energy and Research will come to order. With, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittees at any time. So welcome to today's hearing entitled Materials Science, Building the Future. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today we will have the opportunity to review federally funded research in materials science. I want to thank our panel of witnesses for joining us to share your important research and provide the knowledge necessary to set priorities for basic science research. Materials science is the discovery of new materials with novel structures, functions, and properties. In this area of science, researchers study the chemical, physical, atomic, and magnetic properties of an existing material and use that knowledge to create new materials with ideal properties. By designing and creating new materials, researchers at our national labs and universities can solve complex engineering challenges and enable the development of new technologies. Today, federal agencies ranging from the Department of Defense to the National Science Foundation and DOE are pursuing research in this area because the value to our end users is clear. By tailor-making materials for a specific use, scientists can create materials that increase efficiency and better store energy, reduce environmental impacts while improving the safety of energy production technologies that develop stronger and more resilient artificial joints, improve high-performance computing systems, and better protect our soldiers and athletes in the field. As Madonna would say, we're certainly living in a material world. <laughs> For example, Dr. Fred Higgs here, who joins us from Rice University, my sister graduated from Rice, Dr. Higgs and I were having that conversation, will testify about how the development of materials such as diamond-like carbons and nanocrystalline diamond can lead to a long-lasting wear-resistant artificial knee and hip that could last decades longer than today's technology. At Ames Lab, led by Dr. At, by Dr. Adam Schwartz, who joins our panel today, the Department of Energy has cultivated decades of expertise in metallurgy and materials science. Researchers at Ames Lab pioneered the use of metallic powders in 3D printing. As Dr. Schwartz will testify, this expertise has enabled the production of high purity metal, uh, metal powders that can be used in the creation of industrial parts for military, biomedical, and aerospace applications. I'm also particularly interested in Ames' ongoing early stage research in caloric materials for refrigeration air conditioning, our own air conditioning company which if success, and we're going to talk about this, in fact, the whole hearing may be on this, <laughs> which if successful, I mean, how cool is that, right? Which if successful could save 20 to 25 percent of the generated electricity used for cooling, refrigeration, and air conditioning in the United States. Now let that sink in. 20 to 25 percent of the, of the energy used for refrigeration and air conditioning and heating in the United States. Finally, just this week, a research at Argonne National Lab which Dr. Terrell is testifying on behalf of today, won the 2017 Tech Connect National Innovation Award for developing a more efficient method to create graphene. This one area of material science research could improve technology for advanced touch screens, long-lasting batteries, transparent and conducting coatings for solar cells, and next-generation oil-free solid lubricants. Material science also provides a perfect example of the broad economic benefit of investments in research infrastructure. The core capabilities and user facilities at our national labs are essential for the discovery and design of new materials. There is nowhere else in the world where an individual researcher or company could access a light source, high performance computing capabilities, and the specific expertise in material synthesis that is available in our system of national labs. You may hear today about how this vital area of research is at risk of being left behind because of budget cuts or changing priorities. But basic and early stage research in material science is exactly what this committee has always supported. Discoveries in material science require 
tools, and expertise provided by our national labs, and industry users are ready and waiting to commercialize, 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 it. they're waiting to take it to market. <laughs> Technology based on this fundamental science. Hearings like today's help remind us of the Science Committee's core focus, the basic research that provides the foundation for technology breakthroughs. Before we can ever see the de deployment of a better battery, a stronger material for protective gear, or wear-resistant materials for medicine or energy production, we must invest in the science infrastructure that makes these discoveries possible. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Vesey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my fellow Texan, uh, and also Chair Comstock for holding this hearing. Uh, we have a very impressive uh, panel today, and I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. And I'm going to make my remarks brief because I think that everybody is really interested to hear what they have to say today. Uh, and I'm sure that, uh, as you are aware, uh, we'd be hard-pressed to find a scientific field that doesn't rely on material science at some level to accomplish its research objectives. It is, critically, it is a critically important area of research for answering the most pressing scientific questions and advancing our economy in the 21st century. Lightweight vehicles, high performance building materials, more efficient turbines, uh, and solar panels are just a few examples. The research and development of new materials can provide a direct benefit to consumers with savings on energy bills and benefits to our environment. Scientists at universities, national laboratories, and in the private industry utilize federal research grants and scientific research, research user facilities uh, to explore frontiers of materials research. A better understanding of the properties of ceramics, glass, metals, composites, polymers, and plastics is achieved through materials research. By optimizing these properties, we can address key hurdles in developing new technologies with a variety of applications. Uh, energy efficiency and reliability, public health and safety, and environmental stewardship can all benefit from strong investments in material research. Uh, in fact, I think we could sit here all day and talk about the immense benefits of material research. And I know that, that we're going to, to do just that. And, and like I said a little bit earlier, I think everybody is, is really excited to hear what you have to say. And while there seems to be a strong support for this work in Congress, we cannot have this conversation without acknowledging the short-sighted and harmful Trump budget released last month. The administration's budget would absolutely decimate the all-important fields of material sciences in the U.S. Now, the budget would cut sustainable transportation and renewable energy by 70 percent and energy efficiency by 80 uh, percent. It would cut critical research on the electric grid and fossil fuels in half. Uh, it would eliminate uh, ARPA, uh, e, ARPA E uh, cut the offices of sciences by 17 percent and nuclear energy by 30 percent. All of these programs help fund the materials research that we will hear about today. And even if we wanted to, uh, we can't balance the budget by slashing our research funding. The administration's budget proposals will make the United States less competitive. These cuts would cause us to lose jobs, harm our public health, and hurt our international R&D partnerships. Uh, the proposed cuts uh, are just absolutely puzzling. They just make no sense. And I look forward to hearing from uh, each of you on how the proposed budget cuts at DOE, at NSF, at NIST, uh, per, uh, uh, would hurt uh, us in the area of materials research enterprise and U.S. competitiveness. Um, I am particularly interested in hearing from Dr. Schwartz about the consequences these severe cuts have at his laboratory, uh, which has a special focus on materials research. The administration has claimed that the private sector would simply start funding these key research areas once the federal government cuts them from its budget, but I don't think that's based in reality. Uh, in fact, administration officials recently confirmed that they have not even begun a conversation with the private sector to determine what industry would be able or willing to pick up. So let's get back to reality and continue our strong support for these high-value research programs that are vital for American competitiveness, our quality of life, uh, and our scientific leadership. And before I conclude, uh, I do want to apologize to the chair and the other members uh, and our panelists that are here today. Uh, we're having armed services uh, markup today uh, downstairs, and so I'm going to be uh, back and forth 
Uh, but again, I think that, that what we're going to hear today is uh, really uh, going to be uh, good and, and interested and really appreciate the panelists uh, that are here today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. The good news is that the president doesn't have the last word. He may have the first tweet, but not the last word. Did I say that out loud. I uh, now recognize the chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Research and Technology, Ms. Comstock, for her opening statement. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, today's hearing focuses on vital research and material science. This basic and fundamental research provides the foundation for important new technologies in many fields, including medicine, transportation, manufacturing, defense, energy, and computing, which ultimately helps improve our quality of life and grows the U.S. economy. Behind every new innovation, from the iPhone to the International Space Station, is decades of work by engineers, physicists, and chemists creating the new materials that make it possible. Advances in material science have been achieved in a variety of ways, from public-private partnerships, science prize competitions, and through investments made by the federal government, industry, and universities. By investing in STEM education and the research infrastructure necessary to advance this area of basic research, the federal government can fast track the development of industry-specific materials that benefit American consumers. One recent example of a public-private partnership that I find of great interest is the NIST work alongside the National Football League, General Electric Company, and Under Armour to support an open innovation prize in search of advanced materials to better absorb or dissipate energy. The Head Health Challenge will lead to the improvement and performance of protective equipment like helmets to help and protect head safety for men and women in uniform, Americans who work in manufacturing, construction, and other industries, and those who participate in athletics, starting with children who participate in school sports. We have heard so much recently about the uh, long-lasting impact of head injuries, how it might be connected to Alzheimer's and others. This is really exciting work that's going on. This kind of partnership is particularly encouraging because we should be doing everything in our power to help protect the lives of those who put themselves on the line for our freedom and safety, as well as American workers, and of course, our children in those ever-present sports that we know are wonderful for them, but we want them to uh, perform in them safely. By investing in materials science research, we invest in both innovation and the livelihood of our citizens. Manufacturing is another critical sector where material science innovation can help create efficiency in production. While scientists develop new materials in our national labs and universities, industry applies these new materials to improve manufacturing and create new products that keep the U.S. competitive in the global economy. As chair of the Research and Technology Subcommittee, I am interested in learning more about NIST's work with manufacturers and other private industry partners on new materials testing and standards, as well as the National Science Foundation's investment in basic research at institutions like Rice University. Taxpayer investment in basic and fundamental research, which the private sector can then develop and commercialize, provides significant rewards that improve our society and the lives of our citizens. We must ensure that this research ecosystem is a vibrant, functioning partnership to spur innovation and create new industries and, of course, more jobs. Thank you to our expert witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to hearing your informative testimony. Thank you, Ms. Comstock, and I recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Research and Technology, Mr. Daniel Lipinski, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Weber, and I uh, thank Car Chairwoman uh, Comstock for holding this hearing on federal investments in material science research <coughs> and the economic importance of these programs. Material science and engineering R&D is carried out across several federal agencies. This research, as we will hear more about this morning, has applications across many sectors including energy, defense, transportation, and even human welfare. As uh, Chairwoman Comstock mentioned, the uh, better helmets that uh, can be made uh, to prevent uh, traumatic brain injury. Unfortunately, as the Office of Science and Technology Policy detailed in a 2011 paper, the time it takes to move a newly discovered advanced material from the lab to the marketplace remains much too long. That white paper was the genesis of a multi-agency materials genome initiative, or MGI. The MGI is a public-private R&D partnership that seeks to accelerate the lab-to-market timeline through advances in computational techniques, more effective use of standards, and enhanced data management. The Research and Technology Subcommittee, on which I serve as ranking member, focuses on NSF and NIST. So I want to spend a moment talking about the important materials research programs 
at these agencies. NSF participates in the MGI primarily through the designing materials to revolutionize and engineer our future program. This program is building the fundamental knowledge base needed to increase the precision of new materials development, enable, enabling a shift from trial and error to designing and producing materials with specific desired properties. NSF also contributes to MGI through the Cyber Enabled Materials Manufacturing and Smart Systems Initiative. As part of this initiative, NSF launched the Materials Innovation Platforms Program to develop transformative techniques and instrumentation that will improve understanding and discovery of new complex material systems. NIST scientists conduct research in all aspects of material science with the goal of developing better and new measurement and characterization tools and standards for advanced materials. The agency's major efforts on material science research are supported by the Material Measurement Laboratory, the National Reference, Reference Laboratory for Measurements in Chemical, Biological, and Material Sciences. In addition to its internal research program, NIST also established the Advanced Material Center of Excellence at Northwestern University, Argonne National Laboratory, and the University of Chicago to facilitate the collaboration with leading research institutes in industry. The center supports the goals of Materials Genome Initiative <coughs> by developing computational tools and databases to support materials discovery and production. Finally, NIST manages the Interagency Manufacturing USA Initiative, which includes several institutes focused on advanced materials. I look forward to learning more about all this work from Dr. Ocasio. I want to echo the comments of my fellow ranking member, Mr. Vesey, by expressing my concern about the Trump administration's proposed budget cuts to materials R&D across the science agencies. Not only would these cuts cause us to lose out on economic opportunities our materials research programs create, they would also do great harm to our nation's ability to stay at the cutting edge of materials science in the related health, energy storage, technology, and national security benefits that will be discussed today. We have an excellent panel before us that can help us understand not only material science itself, but also why our investments in this field are so important for the nation. The proposed 11% cut at NSF, the 13% cut to the labs at NIST, and even more draconian cuts at DOE must not, <clears throat> must not be enacted. Today's hearing will give us a few more reasons why we must reject the President's budget request if our nation is to stay scientifically and economically competitive. And I certainly appreciate uh, Chairman Weber's comments about that, uh, about that budget and what Congress will do. Hopefully, we will, uh, we will see robust funding for, for these programs. So I look forward to the testimony and discussion this morning. And I thank the panelists for being here to share the expertise with us. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. It is now time for witness introductions, and I'm going to yield right back to Mr. Lipinski to introduce our first witness today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Matthew Terrell is Deputy Laboratory Director for Science and Chief Research Officer at Argonne National Laboratory in my district. At Argonne, he is responsible for integrating the laboratory's research and development efforts in science and technology capabilities. He is also the founding director of the Institute for Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago, which has a mission to translate advances in basic physics, chemistry, biology, and computation into new tools to address important societal problems. The Institute really recently partnered with Argonne and Fermi National Labs to create the Chicago Quantum, Quantum Exchange, which aims to serve as an intellectual hub for the science and engineering of quantum information and to commercialize discoveries through the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago. Dr. Terrell received his bachelor's degree from Northwestern University, just as I did in engineering, uh, and his PhD from University of Massachusetts Amherst. He dis his distinguished career has included faculty positions at the University of Minnesota, the University of California, Santa Barbara, University of California, Berkeley, and induction into the National Academy of Engineering in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We welcome Dr. Terrell. Happy to have him here today. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Our second witness today is Dr. Lori Lacasio. Is that right? Okay. 
Acting Associate Director for Laboratory Programs and Director for the Material Measurement Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Previously, Dr. Lacasio served as Chief of the Biochemical Division in the Material Measurement Laboratory. She received a Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemistry from James Madison University, a Master's of Science degree in Bioengineering from the University of Utah, and a PhD in Toxicology from the University of Maryland at Baltimore. Welcome. Our next witness is Dr. Adam Schwartz, Director at Ames Laboratory. He is also a Professor of Materials Science and Engineering in the College of Engineering at Iowa State University. Dr. Schwartz had over 20 years of material science research and management experience at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory prior to joining Ames Laboratory. He received a bachelor's degree and master's degree in metallurgical engineering as well as a PhD in materials science and engineering from the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome. Our last witness is Dr. Fred Higgs, a John and Ann Dorr, is that how you said it? Dwar? Dorr? Uh -huh. Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Rice University, where my sister graduated from. Previously, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Higgs received a BS in Mechanical Engineering, an MS in Mechanical Engineering, and a PhD in Mechanical Engineering. You have a thing for Mechanical Engineering. <laughs> from, uh, pronounce that, Rensselaer Polytech. Polytech Institute in Troy, New York. But you finally made it to Texas. <laughs> and so uh, I, I told him he's a native Texan imported from Florida. So welcome, we're glad you're here. And Dr. Terrell, I now recognize you for five minutes to present your testimony and welcome to you as well. Thank you. Chairman Weber, uh, Chairwoman Comstock, Ranking Member VC, and Ranking Member Lipinski, and members of the subcommittees, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the future of material science from the perspective of the U.S. Department of Energy National Laboratories. Argonne National Lab was founded as a chemistry, materials, and nuclear engineering lab in 1946 as the successor to the Manhattan Project's metallurgical lab at the University of Chicago. My colleagues at Argonne and across the national laboratories seek to improve the way this nation generates, distributes, and uses energy. Material science and engineering are essential to this pursuit and to many other sectors of importance to society. Bringing fundamental advances in material science to reality for the ultimate benefit of society requires investments at various stages of development. Though the time scale is accelerating via powerful new predictive computational methods, many developed at DOE laboratories, there remains a long lead time from conception, discovery, and synthesis of new materials to their ultimate useful application. Indeed, important discoveries in material science arise often without any application in mind. National laboratories differ from universities in performing both basic and applied research in an environment where unmatched characterization facilities and capabilities for scale-up exist. The process of taking a fundamental discovery or invention to the point that industry will invest in commercial development is a very nonlinear one involving iteration between fundamental and applied research. Pushing basic science toward practical applications frequently raises new basic science questions that have to be addressed before useful results emerge. The history of electrochemical research at Argonne leading to new materials and devices for energy storage is a case in point. Electrochemical energy storage and research, uh, storage research and development spans the battery field from basic materials uh, research all the way to prototyping. But prototyping uh, often reveals the need for new insight at the fundamental level and inspires new basic research. A specific example is the Energy Innovation Hub at Argonne, the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, or JCSER. Founded in 2012, JCSER has united government, academic, and industrial researchers from many disciplines in a major research project that combines discovery science, battery design, prototyping, and manufacturing science in a single, highly interactive organization. J. Caesar's example of collaborative basic science leading to proof of concept prototypes is one we aim to model in other materials research areas. A second powerful example is in the area of quantum computing. The exponential expansion and the power of information technology, which we call Moore's Law, has catalyzed U.S. productivity and growth for over the, over the last 50 years. 
But like much of our nation's aging infrastructure, this is now ending as roadmaps that have worked since the 1960s are now reaching their limits. The research and industrial communities are mobilizing to search for fundamentally new approaches to information processing. Quantum computing is based on exploiting subtle aspects of quantum physics for unprecedented new information technologies. These technologies implemented via materials design and development can handle computationally complex problems, provide communications security, and sensing technologies in ways that are impossible with conventional hardware. Recognizing this promise, other nations such as China, Canada, and several European countries are investing heavily in quantum material science. Argonne, and in collaboration with the University of Chicago and Fermilab, and I, I might add Ames Lab and NIST, are poised to compete and lead in this area. Water research is a third example where basic material science is needed. Water and energy are deeply interrelated. Uh, cooling and power plants, hydraulic fracturing, petroleum refining, biofuel production account for the majority of water withdrawals, and conversely, water treatment and distribution represents large consumers of electricity. This water energy interdependence is leading material scientists to work on devising new membranes, sorbents, sensors, catalysts, and surface treatments to enable step change improvements in energy water systems. Across the lab complex, the commitment to material science breakthrough means using every specialized tool at hand. At Argonne, we leverage the high energy x-rays of the advanced photon source to see materials at the atomic level and the computing power of the leadership computing facility for materials characterization and simulation. Upgrades underway at each of these facilities will serve to increase their power. So in summary, DOE labs are an enormous asset in pursuing the broad spectrum of material science and engineering research. Thank you for your time and attention to this topic, and of course, we'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Terrell. Dr. Lacoste, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Weber, Chairwoman Comstock, members, uh, ranking members Lipinski and Vizi, and members of the committees, Thank you for the opportunity to discuss NIST's role in enabling advances in materials that strengthen U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness. NIST has helped entire industries overcome intractable challenges by measuring materials with ever-increasing precision and characterizing new materials for the very first time. We help American manufacturers be more competitive by enabling development and testing of materials that perform far better than previous generations. Great leaps in our quality of life are linked to great leaps in the performance of materials. For example, prosthetics and metal medical implants once limited to ceramic and steel and harvested bone are now made from titanium and polymers and composites. They are stronger, lighter, and more functional, helping more people return to work and live active lives. NIST has been an essential partner to industry in supporting that traditional approach to materials discovery. For example, we have helped the US semiconductor industry, which generates $166 billion in global sales, overcome measurement and material limits to making the smaller, faster chips that the market demands. But traditional materials discovery requires costly trial and error cycles. In a new paradigm, NIST supports the use of data and models to simulate materials and, make their, make, and predict their performance before spending the money to make them. This approach is called materials by design. GE used materials by design to make new alloys for jet engines in nine years instead of the typical 15 to 20. And the metal and Apple watches was developed and deployed to market in just two years using this approach. Materials by design is such a game changer that it became a national priority in 2011 with the Materials Genome Initiative. The MGI, as it is known, benefits nearly all economic sectors from the chemical industry to electronics, communications, and biotechnology. The MGI is, is a partnership among 18 federal agencies, including some in the departments of energy and defense, along with NASA and NIST. NIST supports the MGI with new modeling and experimental capabilities, along with materials data. 
For example, the Materials Resource Registry is like an online yellow pages for materials by design, enabling in-depth worldwide searches of data collections, computational services, and modeling software. In this registry, we collect and harvest public data from materials science programs in universities, industries, and government to create a valuable national resource. And with access to all this shared data, researchers can more quickly design unique materials for that next great American breakthrough. To help create an ecosystem for MGI, NIST founded, founded the Center for Hierarchical Materials Design, or TIMAD, a consortium led by Northwestern University, the University of Chicago, and Argonne National Lab. CHIMAD and NIST together are building tools to support the MGI nationally while advancing technologies that the industry cares about, like 2D electronics and more efficient jet engines. Thanks to the support of Congress, Materials by Design is gaining ground across the entire US materials science enterprise. Why is an agency like NIST doing this work? We see ourselves as industry's national lab a well-respected, trusted, non-regulatory scientific agency that forms strong partnerships with industry to tackle critical national needs. Other countries are investing in their own MGI-like initiatives. The US faces ever-increasing competition in this space. We are still the ones to beat, but we need continued coordination and support among all the players across many sectors to retain this lead. We greatly appreciate the members of these committees and others in Congress for the support of federal acceleration of the innovations in material science that keep our nation globally competitive and secure and contribute to our quality of life. I will be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Schwartz. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Weber, Chairwoman Comstock, Ranking Members Vesey and Lipinski, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at this hearing, and thank you for your continued strong support of materials research. The United States is the world leader in material science, condensed matter physics, and chemistry research. Federally funded research has created an innovation system unmatched anywhere, including the private sector. Our leadership is due in large part to governmental science funding across the continuum, from grand challenge and use-inspired basic research to applied research and technology deployment. As a country, we've reaped tremendous benefits in the economics, energy security, national security, and our quality of living. The US leads in discovering and applying new materials with novel properties. New materials discoveries enabled by basic research at our national laboratories and universities have significant economic and societal impacts on our everyday lives. Consider your smartphone, tablet, or almost any other consumer electronic device. Ames Laboratory and Sandia National Laboratories collaborated to create a lead-free, environmentally friendly replacement for lead-based solder. This advanced alloy was ultimately licensed to over 65 countries, 65 companies in 23 countries with an economic benefit to the private sector estimated at $610 million per year. New and experimental, new experimental and computational capabilities developed from sustained federal investment in a talented and dedicated scientific workforce have accelerated the pace of discovery of novel materials. We can now design and create materials tailored for some specific purposes and soon we'll be able to do so much more broadly if appropriate research continues. Great opportunities abound for new materials to impact our world. LED lighting transformed a century-old light bulb industry that hadn't advanced since Edison. Research to replace the current 100-year-old compressed vapor refrigeration with solid-state magnetic technologies enabled by new materials could potentially reduce our energy consumption by one quarter and have transformative impacts. An amazing opportunity also exists in information technology. For decades in the computer industry, the density, speed, and computational power of integrated circuits have increased exponentially over time, as predicted by Moore's law. But we're fast approaching the theoretical limits of processor materials to go beyond more computing 
Research is needed to create new quantum materials that use less energy and provide computing power beyond today's approaches with conventional silicon chips. Tremendous opportunities exist in additive manufacturing or 3D printing, 3D printing of metals to fabricate parts for the military, biomedical, and aerospace industries. Currently, progress is constrained by a lack of fundamental understanding and control of kinetic processes, as well as a lack of suitable metal powders. Collaboration between Ames and other laboratories are pooling their expertise to meet these needs, establishing U.S. leadership in a fast-growing industry. The biggest challenge facing U.S. materials research right now is maintaining our global competitive edge. The rest of the world is catching up. Countries like China, South Korea, and India are investing increasing percentages of their GDP in materials research, and our global competitive advantage in this key enabling science is under threat. Will the U.S. be the first to invent the next catalyst in the $30 billion petrochemical industry? Discover the material that will replace traditional semiconductors in a $350 billion electronics industry or provide options for the next critical material on which our military systems depend. The private sector cannot do this by itself. Federally funded research enables world-changing materials advances like the ability to address critical material shortages through the basic research provided by the Critical Materials Institute, and the ability to design and create new materials to revolutionize the electronics, lighting, refrigeration, and air conditioning industries, among many other manufacturing sectors. The key to future success is sustained research on fundamental principles and the resulting discovery of advanced materials. Ames Laboratory, like other national laboratories and research universities, is on the cusp of great materials discoveries that will further the nation's economic, energy, and national security interests. But we need your continued support and resources to meet our mission. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And again, thank you for your consistent support of materials research. This committee's leadership has paved the way for remarkable innovations. I'd be happy to address any questions or provide additional information. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Dr. Higgs, I recognize you for five minutes. You want, is your mic on? Thank you. Chairman Weber, Chairwoman uh, Comstock, Ranking Members Vizi and Lipinski, uh, and other committee members, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the subcommittees. As the John and Andor Professor of Mechanical Engineering at, and the Faculty Director for the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership at Rice University, I am excited about this opportunity to provide this testimony today. Today I'm here to th discuss the broad economic impact of material science on the nation and the need for America to invest big in basic science in this area and other fields of engineering which are catapulted forward by materials advances. Whenever you see a new flurry of research activity or new radically higher performing technologies, this is almost always related to some type of material advancement or technology deployment that finally figured out how to use a cutting edge material which was discovered by basic science research no less than a decade ago. Today I'll discuss new material advancements, science competitions, and industry lab partnerships. New materials can improve the safety and environmental impact of energy production technologies. In terms of oil and gas drilling, the development of effective environmentally friendly additives in drilling mud may enable more efficient cooling, lubrication, and rock cuttings removal from the drill rock interface. More efficient and environmentally safe extraction processes allow workers to have less exposure to dangerous activities as well. Material advancements can reduce the impact that energy production processes, such as coal and natural gas combustion, have on our environment. There are also technological benefits of material advancements in orthopedic medicine. Advanced coatings, such as nanocrystalline diamond, are very robust and compatible with the human body. There are technological benefits of material advancements in transportation. Tire rolling resistance and high traction compete to hinder fuel performance. Basic science involving nanomaterials are expected to improve tire performance and are expected to save maybe 35 million barrels of oil annually. There are technological benefits of material advancements in manufacturing, particularly additive manufacturing, which most here may know as 3D printing, as you heard my predecessor say. More advanced innovations such as composite materials and graded materials remain underdeveloped. 3D printers are also super slow and cannot speed up until fundamental material science questions are answered. I would like to address another point, crowdsource-based science prize competitions. 
One of the new successful strategies for inspiring open innovation and accomplishing idea mining is science prize competitions. While these can be exciting, as my team has competed in them, the potential loss of university IP can in some cases be endangered when the fine print of such competitions read, by entering this competition, we can use your ideas without permission whether you win or lose. And normally those are industry-based competitions. The committee should employ careful oversight of the non-defense agency's ability to initiate competitions that university researchers perceive as exploitive. In terms of me the merits of university lab partnerships, government labs serve many noble purposes for our nation from an academician's viewpoint. First, they provide our government with research capacity and the personnel and equipment infrastructure to tackle the nation's most pressing problems. Second, they provide a rich research ecosystem of researchers who care about the science of discovery, divorced from the pressures of generating quarterly profits. And third, they provide collaborative resources in terms of intellectual capital, equipment, and mentorship for young researchers. I've worked with different agencies and, and labs, such as NASA Glenn and Nettle. I can honestly say that just like many of my other colleagues who work with government labs, their support of our research has been pivotal in helping people like me mature from a young professor into a leader in my field. Federal labs have even provided guidance to startup companies such as my own NSF-funded SBIR company, Innovalgy. DOE labs such as NREL have advised us of the best path towards technology validation, including connecting us to industrial partners that could benefit commercialization efforts. There are also merits in university company partnerships. A season of research at a Fortune 500 company once said to me, uh, universities use money to create knowledge, but companies use knowledge to generate money. But these days, many companies are desperately looking for PhDs to hire from universities, and yet they spent no money supporting university research. A perfect storm is being set up where companies expect PhDs to just magically be output without anyone making an investment input. Meanwhile, other countries in Asia and Europe are strategic, creating a PhD investment training and hiring cycle that is catapulting their nations over America, the country I so dearly love. It will be a game changer if te companies tax incentivized, uh, were tax incentivized to invest seed money into university basic research. And I'll leave you with the final recommendation for supporting basic research. If Congress were to inject new funds into NSF to increase the number of graduate fellowships from just a factor of two from 2,000 to 4,000, it will be a big game changer in terms of supporting basic research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Higgs. Chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Dr. Terrell, your written testimony touches on an important quality of the national labs, the core capabilities and user facilities that allow a single researcher to use a number of tools at a single lab to make a scientific discovery. What steps could the department take to better streamline access for those researchers across the lab complex? Thank you. Um, well, I, I think uh, we uh, at, at Argonne have uh, uh, several major research facilities, as, as you alluded to, in, in X-ray scattering and in computation, also the Center for Nanoscale Materials, what, what is really important is the uh, staff scientists that uh, staff those facilities because users all often come with an idea of how to, um, of what they want to do, but not necessarily how to do it with our facilities. So we need experts on site really to uh, try to um, make the time that they have on the instrument, which sometimes is 24 hours and it can go from, you know, a, a straight 24 hours, the most effective. So you can get there, get in, and get out with the results that you need. But that requires dedicated and really knowledgeable staff. I, I think that might be the, the principal thing that I would suggest. Okay, <clears throat> so you, <clears throat> we have the scheduled facility upgrades, well, uh, like the advanced photon source. How important are those upgrades for providing the tools needed for the materials research community? There's nothing more important than the, the upgrade to uh, the advanced photon source, both for argon or for the X-ray scattering community uh, in the United States. Uh, it's, it's really the only uh, state-of-the-art uh, hard x-ray, meaning high-energy x-ray facility in the United States that can do certain things. And many other countries are investing, but uh, w what we need is um, 
a, a facility that U.S. scientists can access most effectively. Do you know what where we are on that schedule timeline? Well, uh, a lot of that depends upon the, the rate of funding. Uh, right now, uh, we would uh, have, uh, I believe, I hope I don't misstate it, but roughly uh, dark time, uh, meaning that the equipment would be installed, the new equipment would be installed in uh, 2020, fiscal 2022, and then come up for operation uh, later in fiscal 2023. If the funding uh, that's proposed now uh, is, is maintained, uh, this could be delayed by a year or more. So that, that's the kind of time scale that we're talking about and the implications of the, of the funding profile. Okay, thank you. Dr. Schwartz, this question is for you. In your prepared testimony, you talked about a project currently underway at Ames Lab using caloric materials to improve the efficiency of heating, air conditioning, and refrigeration. Uh, could you describe what these materials are and how they may change the industry for us. Okay, I'll try and make this relatively quick and simple. Caloric materials are a type of material that when you apply a field, a magnetic field, an electric field, or a stress field, there is an internal change in the structure that creates a significant temperature change. So now you can imagine having a closed system where you have a warm fluid coming in, you have your magnetochloric material, for example, you apply a field, it changes the temperature, it cools that fluid coming by, and you have a refrigeration system. It won't use greenhouse gases. It will be environmentally friendly. And if constructed with affordable, earth-abundant, easily manufacturable materials, it could potentially transform the heating, the refrigeration and air conditioning industry. How do you move that fluid? And you know, you use a compressor to remove refrigerant that changes the state twice in the typical refrigeration system. So how are you moving that fluid? I think that would be the same way. You'd have a pumping system that would either bring in the air or the liquid over top of the caloric material. So instead of a compressor that compresses refrigerant from a loosely uh, packed gas into a tightly packed liquid, and then it spews it through a metering device, and it sprays out and has a temperature drop, pressure drop, and it picks up heat there, is there a metering device? I don't know how much work y'all have done on this. This is fascinating to me. In fact, what time is it? We may be here for a day or two. <clears throat> so is there a metering device in this system? How do, how do you get this corresponding temperature and pressure drop in, in that system? So our research is focused primarily on discovering new materials in order to enable this technology to go forward. Uh, and I'd like to point out that, that this, the, the first material of this type was really invented at Ames Laboratory about 20 years ago. Research was funded through basic energy sciences, as it had been for, for some time before that. After the discovery of this material, it wasn't long before industry said, hey, we've got this. Uh, we're going to make something good out of it. Uh, as a result, basic energy sciences said, okay, industry's got it, that's out of our realm, we're not going to fund that anymore. Well, 20 years has gone by, and industry has not been able to pick up that technology because of the inability to do the basic materials research and enable that amazing new material technology to be implemented into something as impactful as revolutionizing the air conditioning and refrigeration industry. Well, the fact that it's 20 to 25 percent of energy consumption, as was pointed out, you know, is, is a pretty astounding figure, and we could go on for a long time, but I'm going to go ahead and, who am I yielding to? Mark is left, so I guess, Daniel, you're up next. The chair, recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start out uh, with Dr. Terrell. Argon is, is home to the um, Energy Innovation Hub called the uh, Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, more commonly known as uh, Jay Caesar. It <laughs> has had uh, great success since 2012, but the, uh, the budget, the Trump budget, proposes to uh, eliminate it. So I wanted to ask you, what would the consequences of eliminating this energy innovation hub be? And would the private sector uh, be likely to, to pick up this work? Thank you. Well. Um, I think uh, it would uh, the 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 cutting of the of Jay Caesar would uh, leave a lot of very promising research results on the table. Uh, 
without further development. Um, I, there have been industry involved in JCSER, Johnson Controls, for example, which is the largest battery manufacturer. But again, uh, it could be a situation such as uh, Dr. Schwartz described, where uh, while the technology is promising, it's not really sufficiently developed that a company is, is able to take it over. Um, having said that, um, it, it's conceivable that uh, there would be ways for the Office of Science to continue its investment in energy storage uh, research uh, at Argonne and elsewhere in the DOE complex. So we don't view it as a, as a great thing that Jay Caesar may be coming to an end, but uh, I think that it has already produced a, a wealth of results that uh, can be followed up on uh, if uh, additional investments are made. Well, we have to, uh, I think, really need to fight here in Congress to make sure that we don't, uh, don't uh, defund these uh, energy innovation hubs for what they are, are doing, where they've gotten so far in the uh, research and development. But I think that really leads me to my second question for, uh, for Dr. Schwartz first and to Dr. Terrell. Uh, there's this um, false boundary uh, that's being claimed between basic research and applied research and saying, well, the federal government, some will say the federal government should only be involved in basic research and not applied research. Uh, I don't think that there really is a, a neat divide here. And Dr. Schwartz, you mentioned in your testimony your concerns about so much that would not be done if, uh, if the federal government just got out of the development part of uh, of the R&D uh, research uh, in development sphere. Can you tell me why, why that is and why the government needs to be involved in the, uh, in the development? Yeah, it, it, there's, a common, there's a common view that research from Grand Challenge in basic science is just a continuum. And that once you start on that path of, of understanding, that that's going to take you to the logical conclusion that could ultimately be commercialized. In my experience, I have never seen anything like that. We make progress in one area that opens up new doors. We might explore that path and then have to come back. So there's the, the, the pipeline model of technology development uh, is only applicable a few percent of the time. There's another model that shows more of a feedback loop where instead of having just one valley of death in the commercialization of a product, you actually have two. One is taking a look at the, at the feasibility of the product or of the material, and of course the second one is the late stage being able to scale up and commercialize it. Uh, it is not a linear path between discovery and implementation. Sometimes, like the case of the caloric materials that I just talked about, it looked like it was promising, but no one had done the full development of the materials to make that feasible as a commercially available material. So the feedback loop happened. Uh, the material was discovered. Industry thought they were going to pick it up, were not able to, or chose not to invest as much as they needed to to get that product available. Uh, and then now energy efficiency and renewable energy through one of its recent energy materials networks has picked up that research again to do the foundational science required to create the new materials that will enable this technology. Thank you for your question. Dr. Terrell, anything briefly you want to add? Yes, uh, certainly I agree with the premise of your question and some of the things that Dr. Schwartz said. I used the terms uh, iterative and cyclic and nonlinear a couple of times in my own testimony. W one thing I'd point to is the Office of Science Basic Research Needs Workshops. Um, there's brochures about them out in the hallway where the Office of Science tries to define important basic research in quantum computing, in water, in synthesis, based on what's needed to carry these things forward into uh, practical uh, technologies. So I, I think we all recognize this interplay between basic and applied research, even just as an intellectual uh, thing in addition to its practical implications. Thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate that. And I do want to add, though, that um, we did the House did pass out HR 589, 
uh, the Energy Innovation Program, where all of those hubs are actually authorized. And fortunately, it's sitting over in the Senate. And we just hope the Senate has enough energy to get something done. Did I say that out loud? I now recognize uh, Barbara Comstock for five minutes. And I don't have a Madonna quote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Lucasio, um, how does a prize competition like the Head Health Challenge promote the development of new materials? And what did NIST learn from participating in this prize challenge? So thank you for the opportunity to speak about that. Um, the prize challenge really is just one tool in our toolkit to leverage federal dollars against private sector dollars. And I think it's an extraordinarily effective way to do that and also to pull in people into an important national problem that may not have been aware uh, about of the problem or how to get involved. And so I think the prize challenge that we conducted with Head Health, it's a partnership between NFL and NIST and GE and Under Armour, mm -hmm. has been very successful in attracting new, new people into the problem associated with public safety and in particular protective gear. For instance, we had um, people competing in the prize challenge who presented new materials that were uh, additively manufactured or um, prepared in the laboratory that were responsive materials or new types of materials made with new processes that had never thought before about using them and harnessing that activity for protective gear. So I think one advantage is really being able to attract new people to these new national problems. Um, and, and uh, our role there is really to con help conduct an unbiased and fair competition. Uh, and we were able to leverage testing equipment that we already had developed for the purpose of um, testing headgear for warfighters uh, and use that to conduct these tests. And in the same time, push forward our capabilities even further into new realms to test these types of materials. And, and how, and maybe some of the others can uh, add to this too, how can, you develop, how can we develop more of those partnerships like that? Because I think the synergies there, the relationships really cross over so many different disciplines. It's really exciting. You, know, you get a lot of different partners who have a lot of different interests in this. So how can we build on that model and find some other areas? And what are some other examples that we might pursue in this area? So I, I'll perhaps start and let others chime in, but we learned a lot from NASA who was conducting prize challenges about how to leverage the, the, ex the external community and, and attract them into these types of prizes. Um, I think it, the first one, that, this was the first one that NIST had conducted and the first one the Department of Commerce had conducted, and we've, we've gotten so much out of it that we currently have several others in the pipeline to um, pr current prize challenges that are being awarded soon. Side that actually, uh, I've been on the side that actually is the competitors for these different challenges. And uh, I, I do admit that when these challenges come out, uh, my students and I, you know, all want to be uh, competitors in some sense, maybe athletes or something. Um, we see that as our opportunity um, as uh, researchers to compete. And uh, we always think we're going to win, of course. Um, but uh, these, you know, competitions have, uh, you know, a really good basis for being able to generate ideas um, and things. And we love it when the government labs are involved with doing these uh, as well. Um, certainly, we, we would just uh, caution that, you know, sometimes when industry is involved with these uh, competitions, uh, they, uh, I've been with several colleagues and uh, you'll write a proposal and at the end of it it'll say uh, any idea that you submit uh, we could actually uh, take your you're giving up uh, your rights to that particular uh, situation so I would just say make sure there's oversight certainly when there's industry there because we don't want it a an awesome idea to be uh, used as a way to backdoor and take IP from universities that could generate uh, revenues to do other important things with basic science. Um, so love the competitions, but we'll just say some oversight when industry is involved, making sure that IP is not uh, given up in the wrong way. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, gentlelady, and uh, Mr. Reese, you're now recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this question is for Dr. Schwartz. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, in the uh, FY 2018 budget proposal, Ames Laboratory did not fare well. 
uh, if this budget were enacted, it looks like your capabilities and scientific workforce will be decimated. And I was wondering if you could lay out the consequences of this budget proposal for Ames Laboratory. And if enacted, do you have an estimate for how this would impact your workforce? Uh, thank you for your question. The, the proposed budget uh, that I've seen for Ames Laboratory uh, proposes a 58% decrease in the budget between the fiscal 18 year request and the fiscal 16 enacted. Uh, clearly a 58% decrease in the overall budget is gonna have an impact on our staff uh, and it is also gonna have an impact on our ability to meet our mission to create materials and energy solutions. Um, how will this budget uh, proposal impact materials research at Ames and, you know, in a, largely uh, how, how would it affect it in the U.S. as well? Yeah. The, the work that is going on at Ames Laboratory, other national laboratories, universities, NIST, is, uh, is successful because of the long-term sustained federal investment. Uh, science is something that progresses continuously, sometimes quickly, more often not so quickly. Interruptions to that flow of science uh, would be significant. Uh, decreases in scientific staffs at the national laboratories uh, certainly slows down projects, if not stops them. It makes it more difficult to pick it up. In addition, the, the potential decrease in funding uh, in the materials areas sends a message to uh, high school students, college students, uh, early career researchers at universities and assistant professors. Uh, and I'm not sure that's a message that, that we wanna send. Materials research has been demonstrated to provide economic value, energy security value, national security value. Uh, I would like to see that progress continue at a rapid pace. Uh, and this is sort of regarding the first question that I asked you uh, about your workforce. Could you be specific about um, uh, exactly how many people uh, would be laid off or, or what numbers your workforce would be reduced with these budget cuts? We have done an estimate based on that 58% decrease from the 18 budget to the 18 proposed uh, to the 16 enacted budget. And assuming that we do not use funds that are carried over from existing what we have now, we're looking at a, a decrease in the overall staff approaching 40%. Thank you very much. Uh, and this message is uh, for Dr. Uh, uh, Terrell or Terrell. Uh, I know that the drastic cuts proposed in the budget would have major consequences for our on National Laboratory. I was wondering if you could also walk us through the impacts that this budget proposal would have on the capabilities and workforce of Argonne if, if it were enacted. Yes, um, the, obviously if those cuts are enacted, the, the capabilities in the, in the spirit of Chairman Weber's question about how we could staff user facilities may be affected. Um, the cuts will, will affect our capabilities and workforce. Um, partly as a, as a measure to protect morale, we haven't made public uh, statements of uh, you know, exact estimates because we, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. There was a, uh, you know, a business newspaper in Chicago that suggested that the cuts would be something like 700 combined across Argonne and Fermilab. But uh, that's, a, that's an independent estimate that we are, are not part of. But clearly, um, it will impact our capabilities and workforce. And, and you know, a, a thing that, that's important to recognize, and it's true of national labs, university labs, and industrial labs, they're much easier to tear down than they are to build back up after that. So it's, a, it's an important uh, step to think about. And also, I wanted to just ask you specifically about uh, your portfolio of material uh, research at Argonne. Could you just very quickly say how that would be impacted? Well, well, as I mentioned in my own testimony, we do span in several areas, such as energy storage from electrochemistry to battery prototypes. 
uh, as I understand the, the budget proposal, we'd be hit more heavily on the applied end uh, of that. So how, how well uh, we could get things to the point of commercial implementation, I think, would be the, the place where the, the pressure would be applied by these budget cuts. Uh, thank you, Dr. Terrell. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my balance of my time. All right, thank you, Mr. Bessie. We now recognize Mr. Dunn for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Weber. Uh, good morning to, to the panel. My name is Neil Dunn. I'm a medical doctor, recently turned congressman from Florida. Uh, so the chance to listen to so many great scientists is a real pleasure for me. This is my only dose of science I get, really, uh, up here in Washington. So thank you very much. Uh, in our district, we have Florida State University, one of the preeminent uh, research universities in the country. Uh, we have a new material science and engineering program there. It's rather large, but perhaps most famously includes the, the National High Field Magnetic Lab. And I suspect maybe you've co collaborated with them from, uh, from time to time. And <clears throat> I'd like you to keep that in mind as, I'm, as I make the comments and ask, ask my questions. Uh, uh, I'd like to start with Dr. Higgs. Uh, first, Dr. Higgs, I want to encourage you to think of your sojourn in Texas as temporary. Uh, I know that the... Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. <laughs> <laughs> the sugar white sands are calling to you even as we speak. I, I know. So you actually said something very important, especially in, the com uh, in this time of compressed budgets, and, and it was uh, about the university IP. So historically, I think universities, as you say, they turn money into knowledge, and, and they may spend $100 million in a year, and then on royalties, they'll get a million dollars back. Well, that's a very poor return on investment. I think we all recognize that. Now, there's many universities, I'm sure some of the leading ones that you deal with are, have adopted newer techniques, but it's important, I think, that we push this out into the labs as well, these partnerships, because uh, you're right. Uh, they, th your, your faculty and your postgrad students take with them IP into the private sector and they try to you know, monetize that. And I think we can keep them in the faculty, keep them in, in, the, in the labs, your labs, if we share that the, uh, the IP, the ownership of the IP in a more intelligent fashion. I think you're doing that. Am I right? Answer that, Dr. Higgs. It sounded like you had some familiarity with, with how to parcel out the IP, the rights to the IP, so that you kept the talent and, and you know, the, the ideas still got to market. Right. So, good question. So, first of all, I want to say I'm originally from uh, Tallahassee, Florida, so your district, and I did, uh, partic <laughs> and I did participate in pre-college engineering programs uh, that motivated me to pursue a PhD in mechanical engineering. It was at the Florida State University and Florida a &M University uh, Minority Introduction to Engineering. Come on back, the water's fine. Right. <laughs> right, it was at this program where I had the sophistication to realize that a terminal degree uh, was the way to go. Um, so I think uh, your district for uh, supporting uh, young dreamers like me. Uh, uh, certainly uh, we, you know, we have a, a, a responsibility to our employer, the university, that whenever we generate uh, an idea, that uh, the idea belongs to them because of the, uh, the Bear Dole Act. Um, and, uh, but we are really most interested in working in uh, basic science, but we live in a capitalistic society, so these things have to be funded. Uh, and you're right, so companies uh, fund us and we do the research. Uh, the companies will ultimately get our students um, there, uh, the IP that's in the university, the whole goal of it uh, is to actually get into the uh, market to help. Chairman uh, Weber is going to cut us off quickly, yeah. so I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to mm -hmm. say that I, I encourage mm -hmm. all of you to think of those public-private partnerships and, and really help, that helps monetize your lab, or monetize the ideas, but also keep the, the people in your, in your lab where you, where you want them. Dr. Schwartz, so regarding your caloric material on refrigeration, um, you, you have a cooling source we have in Tallahassee, a, a company that manufactures a frictionless bearing. It's a magnetic bearing, no lubrication. And they turn in 20, 25% savings on industrial HVAC units. I think, you know, we've got a marriage here. I'm playing matchmaker. Okay. So I think you've got to, you put those two things together, somebody to move the fluid or the air in, uh, Tallahassee. In fact, my staff will no doubt share with you the name of that company so that you can work with them. Uh, 
in the 30 seconds remaining to me, uh, Dr. Lucasio, how do you define success when you're looking at grant applications? What, what, what makes you define a great grant? So we go through a peer review process for all of our grants. It's a very well-structured process, and uh, it's pretty common across all There's of There's no hook right now in your mind. In, in a low, in a low uh, monetary, in a budget kind of finance, what do you do? What are you looking for? Oh, uh, how are we um, pursuing grants? Are we going to continue to pursue well, grants? Well, our time expired, but I'm and I and I've already tested the chairman's patience. So no, no, that's right. Go ahead. I'm, I'm interested <laughs> yeah. in her answer. So we will continue to to put out grants to universities. Um, we have had obviously we've had very hard decisions to make as well. Um, with regard to the budget, but one of the things that we've thought about is really protecting the future. And protecting the future means also protecting our uh, abilities to do the greatest advances in measurement science that you can possibly do. And that honestly requires the, uni the universities. We have to collaborate with the smartest minds in the United States and pair them with the smartest minds in the federal government, and we do that to great benefit, so we'll continue to Put Thank you very this. much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You betcha. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Foster for five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before I return to this uh, today's symposium theme on magnetocaloric refrigeration, I would um, like to just make a few comments uh, about you know the the elephant in the room here, which is the proposed draconian budget cuts. Uh, to the entire laboratory system. Uh, earlier this month, I was joined by 55 of my colleagues in sending a letter uh, to the heads of all seven science agencies asking about the impact of the, our Republican president's budget request on jobs, not only at our national laboratories, but at our universities that rely on federal funding to train the next generation of scientists. We have yet to receive uh, any response to this. And I think that, you know, despite the, the risks that have been mentioned to the morale of everyone in Involved. I think it's it's important that we look this dragon in the eye and make sure that uh, all members of Congress who claim that they support science speak up at times when science funding is at this kind of threat. So without uh, objection, I ask unanimous consent to, to submit uh, this letter to the record. So ordered. Um, no, to get back to the fun stuff, um, uh, material science, you know, like many other disciplines, has you know benefited very greatly from uh, R&D funding. And so, actually, if I return to Dr. Schwartz for a second, despite the fact that um, you do not, uh, you're not uh, part of my constituency, as uh, Dr. Terrell is, um, you know, you mentioned a 40 percent. A 40 percent is a rough estimate uh, for the the, the layoffs. Um, when that sort of thing happens to a technical staff, um, if a future administration or a future um, Congress decided to just restore that, can you just throw a switch and immediately regrow the technical expertise that's been lost? Or is it more complicated than that? I think it would be much more complicated than that. Uh, scientists who uh, either choose or are forced to leave their jobs will uh, look for others. I don't believe that private industry is going to be able to pick up all the researchers that, that would become available through, through this budget. Uh, they would then search to change their fields. Uh, we have many researchers at Ames Laboratory and across the national laboratory system who have come from foreign countries. There would be a significant risk that many of those scientists would return to their home countries. They would take their education, their experience, all of the investment that we have placed in them, free of charge, back to their country. Uh, right now, we are trying to extend our global leadership in materials research. Uh, I think slowing down that progress uh, and then restarting it later would be quite a challenge. And is maybe someone else on the panel could comment on the effect that that would have on the morale of younger uh, students coming into the field or postdocs coming into the field when they see you know massive layoffs in their often very focused field of expertise, uh, Dr. Hickson. Well, that's what my notes were actually saying. That's a very perceptive question. I mean, if you think of a lab like say uh, Ames or, or Argonne in particular. Argonne has some, uh, in my area, they have some very prominent uh, tribologists. Uh, and uh, essentially what happens is, if the tribologist is just uh, a little known, once they are removed and someone says, hey, you know, this particular scientist uh, no longer has a job, 
then the entire community goes, what does this mean for tribology? Should we all try to head for Silicon Valley? Should we all do something with a right now implication as opposed to a long-term implication, which is what basic science has? And then the younger students, we have to give a speech to encourage them to stay the course, but yet we're uncertain as well. So definitely, uh, even though we're in the university environment, whenever there's a cut to a prominent uh, area or a prominent scientist, uh, once they're removed from the equation, there are a lot of questions that we have to answer as academicians and the students are asking about that. And the excitement and the morale definitely takes a hit. Yeah, thank you. I think it's, that's a very important thing for, for Congress to understand, that this is not at all like saying starting and stopping a highway construction project, uh, that you can't just throw the switch and, and recover the damage that was done. Um, and it's all right, now let's see, I have a little bit of time left. So I'm going to return to um, magnetocaloric refrigeration. Uh, it's, it's my understanding that the, the fluid, the working fluid that's here is largely just a heat transfer fluid. There's no phase change involved. And the compressors involved are a small fraction of the total power to do, perform the refrigeration. Is that a, a correct understanding or is it more subtle than that? There are lots of details on how you would implement a solid state magnetic or electric or stress induced uh, uh, cooling system. Uh, our focus right now is the very, very early stages. Can we develop the materials in order to, that, that demonstrate that have those large temperature change? Uh, at that point, we will turn it over to our mechanical engineering friends who will then design the system, optimize the fluid flow, heat transfer, and others. Right now, our focus is really on creating those materials that will enable the transformation in air conditioning and refrigeration. Yeah, and the, the rest of the problem, just the getting the, the heat transfer fluid across the plates or whatever they are, is a rel it's closer to being a solved problem and an engineering optimization. The magic is the material that you have to make work and at high efficiency, high lifetimes, all the challenges. That is my understanding, okay, yes. Okay, good luck. I really look forward to having refrigerators that don't rattle in the middle of the night. So thank you. And last much longer. Thank you for your question. If you'll, if you'll quit getting snacks out of the doors and, at midnight, then you won't hear that rattling. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Marshall for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, both Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Higgs mentioned 3D printers. Uh, Chairman Lamar Smith and I recently got to go to Wichita State University and see the largest 3D printer in the world, about a third the size of this room, and would love to in invite you all to come see what they're doing there on their innovation center. Always believe it's opportunities to promote uh, each other and work together. I was going to ask Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Higgs both what they see, what's next for 3D printers, uh, specifically, you know, what's going to be a, a game changer, what type of more viable mass do we need, what do you see next for 3D, 3D printers? Uh, Dr. Higgs, you want to go first? Very good. Thank you for the uh, question. Uh, definitely, I mean, if you think about it, uh, when you look at uh, Star Trek, you don't see really big uh, engineering, uh, manufacturing labs. Uh, you just see something very small and then they ask for the product to be developed. Uh, and so that's kind of where additive would have to head. So you would want essentially to be able to uh, additively manufacture anything. Yep. And that means that you have to be able to work with multiple materials. Right now you see a beautiful 3D printer, but when it but it only prints a, a limited amount of, say, uh, materials um, that are there. So if it's a, the big one that you talked about, it's probably a metal printer. And if it is, it's a limited set of materials. But if you want to print uh, something that's, say, biocompatible, then you may not be able to use steel or, or gold or something like that. And so you need to be able to change out the different materials. If you want them, since it's additive, you can build part by part. You want the mechanical properties to change as you want them to. Then that means you have to have a functionally graded material, which means that it may start one me mechanical property at one end and be another at the other end. Right now, that can't be done. And so there's some important material science questions which have to, has to be answered. But the point is that you want print anything as you want, as, as it could occur. Additive can do that in principle, but the basic science questions have to be answered to uh, unveil that uh, to sure. the society. Okay. Dr. Schwartz, anything to add? That's, a very, that's an excellent question. Uh, and, and to me, the key to successful deployment of additive manufacturing in this growing industry in the U.S is all about understanding the materials properties. 
researchers have been trying to understand details of steel, aluminum, titanium alloys for decades, if not centuries, and they still don't have full understanding. Now we want to make additively manufactured parts out of the same materials, but the process is so much different. The composition will change as you melt and remelt as you make the powders. Right now, I believe the key is getting a fuller fundamental understanding of starting at the, at the very beginning, developing the metal powders. Without the metal powders, mm -hmm. none of the metal additive manufacturing happens. Those powders have to be pure, they have to be spherical, they have to flow nicely, they have to have the right surface conditions. And all of this is based, we, we need that basic research understanding to get there. Uh, no one has ever looked at laser melting of particles in great detail. This is a brand new field. Uh, Ames Laboratory is working with SLAC and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in using one of the national user facilities. Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory, in order to understand that the, the early stage materials melting and resolidification and development of that most important internal structure that's going to control the properties. Yeah. It's a very exciting time. It is. One of the exciting things I saw was the ability to, to take away from the product that it's printing and telling the machine or to, to uh, maximize the efficient, to maximize it. So they were doing wing replicas and trying to have a stronger wing for airplanes, for jets, but yet lighter, and to see that technology come forward. So it is very exciting as a physician to see what they're doing in joints, to think that instead of having your choice of hip joints as small, medium, or large, you could actually make one that fits your joint is exciting. Last question for Dr. Higgs. I see that you uh, won the NSF Career Award, so congratulations. Professors at Kansas State University, which is the champion of the Texas Football League this past year, having defeated this gentleman's time is also Texas, expired. <laughs> Texas A&M, TCU, and Texas Tech. Uh, anyway, professors at Kansas State University, Wichita State University, and University of Kansas have all won that recently. Tell us a little bit about that and how it's what you're doing with that foundation grant, please. Uh, very good. So uh, I had a, an NSF uh, career award. It's it's uh, supposedly given to the nation's youngest, uh, uh, best young researchers. And I, and I do want to say that the research from that, uh, which was actually to develop slurry technology, uh, was about five years after that grant, uh, it became an NSF SBIR company, Innovalgy, that I now have. And so it's making it back into the uh, marketplace because of the basic science research that's now translated into a small company. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Ms. Susan Bonamici is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the witnesses for being here today. I want to start by aligning myself with, a, with Dr. Foster's comments about uh, education and the message that these budget cuts send both to students who are contemplating graduate school or students who are an undergraduate trying to decide their career path. I just came from the Education and Workforce Committee on which I serve. Uh, and have, um, uh, as a priority, wanted to make sure that we are educating people here in the United States for the, the jobs of tomorrow. And I'm very concerned about the, the sort of shift in the message that we're sending. You know, there was a time when federal funding for research and development was growing and graduate students were optimistic about careers in research. We need to get back to that message to our students and our potential uh, uh, new scientists across the country. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Um, and in our leadership. And I, I just point out as, as one recent, very recent example that disappointing decision to exit the Paris Climate Accord and then immediately France started recruiting our scientists. We need to have U.S. leadership here and maintain that leadership. Um, and I'm, again, very, very concerned and share the concerns of others about what these budget cuts, uh, what the message is to students and to the, to the rest of the world. Um, I'm, uh, you know, Congress really needs to think holistically and long term about supporting the sciences. I'm concerned about multi-year projects, which uh, Mr. Foster mentioned, and I've heard from scientists in Oregon are very concerned about the lasting effects of these cuts to their research, to the country, to our, our leadership in the, in the global community. Um, Dr. Higgs, could you speak briefly about the concerns of your students when they're considering uh, continuing careers in research? How do you advise them uh, about their future careers in light of these um, uncertainties and proposed budget cuts? And I do want to save time for another question. 
Very good, uh, good question. So uh, we definitely are always trying to aim them at uh, going to academia, a government lab, or uh, industry. Um, we, we would really like to work on basic science because we know fundamentally that'll translate into anything um, there. But you become more constrained as, as cuts come. Cuts usually mean, government cuts usually mean that basic science is out. And so then we have to work on someone's specific problem. And so then we become uh, people who are out looking for funding all of the time rather than uh, educating because we have these young, uh, bright minds who we really want to go through and get a PhD um, there. Absolutely. So we, we look at mentoring them. Government labs we work with, they also mentor our students Right. As well. We want them to get their PhD and stay here. Um, so in, in the president's, this is um, Dr. Schwartz, in the president's budget proposal, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy would receive a 70% cut, the Renewable Energy and Sustainable Transportation Portfolio, 70% reduction, energy efficiency, 80% cut. This is concerning. Clean energy jobs are an important driver of our economy, and the research helps advance these industries. In fact, the Bureau of Labor Statistics found that wind turbine service technicians it's one of the fastest growing occupations. Many of those jobs are in rural areas. How would these massive cuts to EERE affect materials research at your labs and in the clean energy industry? And how would they affect the, the, the growing, rapidly growing clean energy job sector? Specifically for Ames Laboratory, we have really four main projects that are funded through energy efficiency and renewable energy. The Critical Materials Institute, one of the four energy innovation hubs, uh, a very important uh, scientific endeavor, early stage basic research that is, that, is, that is supplying critical options for the United States moving forward with regard to rare earths and other critical materials. Uh, just last week, the only mine in the United States that was producing rare earth materials was sold. We now have no capability to to mine rare earths, uh, that's a big concern for me in terms of economics and in terms of national security. The, another big project, the Caloric Materials Consortium that we've spent a little time talking about today, that is also funded by EERE. The powder synthesis work that we are doing, trying to create uh, optimized metallic powders to enable the 3D printing industry, that is also funded by EERE. All of those are in jeopardy if this budget goes through. And, and in my remaining time, could you, um, uh, Dr. Schwartz, address uh, the President's budget declared some research at, at an early stage worthy of federal support and other activities as later stage research that should be immediately eliminated given that the private sector is supposedly better equipped to carry them out. Um, I'm very concerned about this because the administration uh, confirmed that they did not engage with the private sector. So in your experience, are the cuts proposed in the budget research areas that the private, is the private sector willing to simply start funding if the federal government cuts these? I shouldn't be speaking for the private sector. Uh, I gave one example earlier of when, when Ames Laboratory developed a new material. Uh, industry says, okay, we've got it. Uh, they didn't get it. And about 20 years later, we are reinvestigating. We are pursuing that path again. I'm sure there are cases where, where private sector can pick some of it up. I, I don't think that that's going to be sufficient. Well, I, I see my time has expired, but I would like to follow up on that later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for yielding back. Mr. Webster, you are up for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I'd like to focus in on one thing, and that is a couple of years ago, there was a sort of the storm of the century in the Northeast, and um, there was about $50 billion it cost the federal government to um, pay for the damages that were done there. Uh, also, back a few years ago, I, I have relatives in Chicago and, and in Oak Ridge, and I have toured both the uh, national laboratories there. Seems like maybe one, maybe both were working on uh, some fiber uh, for composite material that would be way less expensive than what it is at that time. And that was, I'd be, I was interested mainly in the construction industry um, because of resilient construction. I've been trying for a few years here to get, I did finally got uh, resilient construction defined, so now we have it defined. And uh, yet I could see the real potential 
uh, with composite materials uh, in construction uh, area, not only from a lightweight, but also a durability, so that when we have these storms, uh, you know, our loss may have been in the hundreds of millions, but, but not $50 billion. Uh, could someone talk about, may, maybe uh, Dr. Terrell, uh, of what's going on at the national laboratories in that research area? Thanks uh, for that question. Um, th there's, um, that, that's one of many kinds of uh, uh, efforts in composite materials some of which are based on additive manufacturing, some of which are based on um, new polymerization methods. Most, many of these things are, uh, have organic uh, plastic components to them. That's where the light weight comes from. Would that also, can I just say? Sure. Would that facilitate using uh, these uh, 3D printers? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was getting at. And I, I did, I wanted to say something er earlier too, um, I think, there's huge frontiers on, on 3D printing. Um, as 3D printing developed, it really wasn't 3D printing in a way. It, it was 2D printing over and over again. But now, by the application of other kinds of fields of light and so on, not, I'm a polymer scientist myself, so I'm thinking more about the organic materials than the metals. But uh, one can make uh, really spectacularly different 3D shapes than could be made in the early days of 3D printing of polymers. There's startup companies in this area. Uh, but anyway, at, at, the, at Argonne, which is what I'm representing today, uh, we're trying to open up a, a field that we call manufacturing science. And By the way, Do, Do, uh, Dr. Don Hillebrand gave me the tour. Uh, good, <laughs> yes. Well, he's the director of our uh, energy systems yes. division. And that's right. Uh, manufacturing science refers to the new science questions that come up when you try to take something from the laboratory into larger scale production. You're doing it bigger, faster, cheaper, and the, the materials just don't behave the same way at, at that scale and at those time scales as they did in the lab. So uh, Argonne is trying to uh, be a leader in, as I said, what we're calling manufacturing science, which is new basic science applied to a manufacturing scenario. Are you familiar with the term um, resilient construction? Yes. Uh, the whole idea is that you can use the building the next day. Yeah, right, once, yeah. once the wind comes or whatever comes. Yeah. yeah. Resilience in general is a big focus uh, at Argonne, which extends beyond material science, but we're on materials here today, so. Well, in our and in the other along with those same lines in in science, um, there is a matter of fact, it seems like there's a couple of universities offering con corrosion engineering as a as a graduate uh, graduate degree, and um, it just seems like that the construction, especially in the maybe the realm of steel or other things where there's so much con uh, um, corrosion that there would be some usefulness in that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a huge economic uh, drain. I mean, we, so far we've lived with it, but the point is if you could stop it or make materials last longer, and there, there, are, there are various centers of excellence. It's not a particular focus at Argonne. But. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, Dr. Higgs, too, I'd like to say to you, come back to Georgia Tech. Uh, uh, I just did the commencement exercise there here a few, few weeks ago, but uh, uh, you would... You were a great uh, contributor at that time. It's been a while, but anyway. Thank you. I, I, when I graduated as an engineer, my mom gave me a card that said, four years ago, I couldn't even spell engineer. And <laughs> then you open it up on the inside, it said, now I are one. So right. I still are one, even though I've got a different profession now. Go back. Did she ask for any repayment of the money back? I'm just. <laughs> she should have. I, I understand. Our parents give us a lot, don't they? Ms. Esther, you're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to encourage my friend Daniel Webster to join the Corrosion Prevention Caucus with me and Pete Olson and the Resiliency Caucus, because we are very interested in these issues, and again, I think this is an area where basic research can save money, save lives, and would encourage that to be part of sort of our national initiative, and particularly with a move to pull us out of the climate accords. Climate's gonna do what it's gonna do. We need to be prepared, so I'd encourage all my colleagues to do that. I had a couple of things I wanted to quickly go through in the limited time I have. 
First was just to give an example that illustrates what many of my colleagues have talked about. I represent Connecticut. UConn has the Materials Genome Initiative funded through NSF. They're deeply worried. They came to meet with me a couple of weeks ago and are very concerned about what these proposed cuts would do to their program. And many of those issues you've discussed about not only losing those particular projects, but in so doing, lose the talent pool, lose the grad students, lose the entire lab. And so I just think we really need to understand the implications. It's not a one-year cut. We actually risk losing them to other countries. We list, risk American competitiveness. So that's when I just want to lend my voice to others. Uh, the two other topics I want to quickly touch on, one is on ARPA-E, and the other is on STEM diversity and diverse workforce, um, which many of us are pretty passionate about. Um, Dr. Terrell, I know that you've, the Argonne Lab has done a lot of work on RPE. If we're going to look at advanced materials and energy efficiency, it's incredibly important. You've done a lot of imp important work. We're looking at you know, dramatic, basically, elimination of that. Could you talk a little bit about whether you think the private sector can fill in that gap, you know, the difference between who does basic research and who doesn't do basic research? Uh, I appreciate the mention, Dr. Higgs, of SBIR and that translation from basic research into commercial uh, exploitation. But the basic research still has to be done, Dr. Terrell, if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, it, it does turn out that I'm part of an ARPA-E project uh, uh, based at, at Argonne that has to do with how to uh, improve the both acoustic and thermal insulation of windows. Uh, with polymer coatings, and as I mentioned, I'm a polymer scientist. Um, and so, you know, with a very well-defined need specified, we'd like to have this much insulation for sound and this much insulation for heat. And, and by the way, you can't make the windows foggy or anything like that. We're trying to design some polymers that, that will do that. So it's, it's, a, it's a good example of uh, use-inspired basic research. Um, I, I also pointed earlier on to the basic energy science, basic research needs uh, workshops that uh, in, in some ways frame things like that. They, they look at what uh, an area of technology needs and then talks about where we're missing out in basic research. On the EERE or the energy efficiency and renewable energy, I, I think within that there are great ways of advancing U.S. energy competitiveness. Um, there's the Advanced Manufacturing Office, which, which relates to some of the things I was saying to Representative Webster about uh, manufacturing science. Um, so, you know, I think these are valuable programs. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, they, they do things in a special way and uh, produce good results. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Locasio, I know you've recently blogged about diversity in science and your son's pride in you being a scientist. Um, and I was just with my big data son early this morning and thought about the importance of, of modeling that. And Dr. Higgs, you're noted for your efforts as well. Quickly for both of you, what can we do? What can the U.S. Congress do that would help ensure we are actually opening up that pipeline for each and every young person in this country to understand these are exciting fields. And we need their talent. We need their life experience. We need their input and their energy. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak about this. I'm so passionate about it as well, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so there are several things that you talked about. First, getting people into the workforce is very difficult, and as you said, um, getting getting female or attracting females into the STEM research fields is very difficult. So, given the fact that there could be changes in the way that we're recruiting and attracting people at this particular time in in, um, in the budget, I think it, it makes that even more difficult. Um, but the second part is retaining them, and then the third part is elevating them to a stature of leadership. And so that's something that I have really thought a lot about. How do we make sure that no matter what you look like or where you come from, what your cultural background is, we need you at the table in order to get the best people and the best ideas out there and supported for the sake of science in the United States. And so, um, so mentoring, guiding people, trying to make sure that we have adequate salaries to recruit them and retain them. 
Um, they're all important facets of the, of the equation. But then just making sure that we elevate them and promote them fairly, equally, and then showcase their talent in front of people so that they can be seen, I think is critical. Uh, very good question. Uh, so I, I will definitely say that uh, we, we like to produce a diverse number of scholars. Um, a, a lot of you all have met goals because you've seen people that look like you. And it's, it's the same thing, uh, dynamic that goes on with young people. I myself graduated from a historically black college and university, saw people that looked like me, had PhDs, and so I wanted to do that. I see my friend over here, Chris Jones, just got his uh, PhD from MIT. He's a graduate of Morehouse College as well. He saw people that looked like him and that he wanted to go and be an astronaut and do other things like Mr. Weber, become a politician and an engineer as well. So it's a very important part of uh, producing the nation's next generation of scientists and engineers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair Nick, I now recognize Mr. Holtgren for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all so much for being here. This is uh, really important, something we're passionate about, I'm passionate about, and uh, research and development is so core, and especially that basic scientific research is something that we've got to make sure funding is continued to, to uh, remain, something the private sector can't do. It's something we're gonna continue to fight uh, with the current administration and also fought the past administration oftentimes where they were pushing certain types of projects uh, and away from basic research. And so uh, I want you to know there's strong voices on both sides of the aisle that are, have continued that commitment and will con continue to fight. Also uh, share my Illinois colleagues uh, to thank Argonne. Uh, thank you, Dr. Terrell, and, and the great work that Argonne is doing. Uh, we're so proud of you, uh, so proud of uh, what's happening at Argonne, but also at a time when there's not a lot to brag about in Illinois. Uh, we can brag about our research and uh, so proud of Argonne and Fermi. You, you look at the data, uh, the Elsevier and the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition uh, rankings recently put uh, Illinois ranking at 94th percentile in publication impact for material science fields, 86th percentile in publication volume. Very impressive and something we absolutely are proud of. And I think a, a large reason we've got that big impact is because the National Lab's accessibility, uh, certainly to students, uh, but also as user facilities, they're crown jewels in our research ecosystem and uh, gives access to researchers throughout the country to high-end tools which no one university or business could ever maintain or have access to. So thank you. Keep up the great work. We're here to support you. Uh, th these user facilities uh, are also proposed in a, a well-thought-out manner uh, where the research community must set goals through the advisory committee process and base these facilities on long-term needs. The 2016 BSAC report uh, called the Advanced Photon Source Upgrade and I quote, absolutely central to contribute to world-leading science and ready to initiate construction. Dr. Terrell, I wonder if you could explain to the committee why this facility upgrade is absolutely central to con contribute to world-leading science. Also, could you describe who the users are at such a facility? Uh, where will this research be done if not uh, here in the United States? Thank, thanks very much. Uh, yes, uh, th there's over 5,000 users every year uh, of the advanced photon source. Uh, the upgrade is really necessary to keep it at the state of the art or push the state of the art. Uh, and by that, what we mean is uh, intensity and coherence of the X-ray beam. And the more intense and the more coherent, the better, uh, the, the more like a really infinitely powerful microscope the X-ray source becomes. So it's um, sort of changes its nature a bit from a scattering tool to an imaging tool. Uh, investments are being made in Europe and in Japan, and uh, they're pushing the frontiers too, but the APS upgrade will land us uh, in 2025 with the best hard X-ray source in the world, uh, and uh, that'll keep not only the, the U.S. science community strong itself, but it'll be keep people from all over the world coming here because we are the best. And yeah. that's very enriching. It is, and that's, I think, the point that we always have to continue to, to bring, come back to, remind ourselves, certainly the value of these 5,000 plus users, the access that they have, the multiple impact uh, on our economy for new discoveries there heard about some amazing things uh, that are coming out that, that really could be game changers uh, for the world as far as energy goes, uh, but also economic impact. So it, it is really important. The other th 
point you bring up is uh, this research likely is going to happen, uh, if not here, somewhere else. A lot of other countries are aggressive. They're not where we are. They're not able to lead right now. But if we fail, they're willing to step in. But uh, we're also recognizing for us to be a part of important, big, groundbreaking, earth-shattering research, collaboration likely is going to have to be a part of that, reaching out and bringing other countries as part of that. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about uh, that, looking for solutions to new problems like new materials for batteries or solving other problems in material science, how collaboration works within our own country. So Fermilab working with Argonne and the University of Chicago at the Institute of Molecular Engineering for the Chicago Quantum Exchange. Uh, talking a little bit about these hubs, but then also how that's a draw on the international stage as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, th thanks very much. Um, you know, back on the thing you said about Elsevier, I was actually contacted by a writer from Nature magazine who, who wants to write a story about material science in northern Illinois, which Great. is something I've been hoping for for fantastic for, for a while. The Chicago Quantum yeah. Exchange is, is an effort to merge our resources among the institutions in, in northern Illinois and in the Chicago area to lead in the next phase of, of what would, might be called post Moore's law computing. And that's, again, um, a, uh, you know, a very, very competitive situation. I, I have in front of me two weeks ago Science Magazine that touts the Chinese communication satellite that right. demonstrated quantum communication between a satellite and Earth. You know, the, the world, uh, the United States, you know, just went into uh, really overdrive when Sputnik was launched in the, in the 50s. That was launched by a country that was our adversary, but was not in any kind of economic shape to, to drive developments. China's a whole different story. They are. You're absolutely right. And I think that is something that will be continuing to be motivating for us as members of Congress, but also I think this administration, uh, that, uh, that we can lead, we need to lead, we should lead. Uh, we're in the right spot, but we've got to make sure that we're following it up uh, with the proper support there. I could go on for another 20 minutes. Thank you all for being here. We're so proud of you. Dr. Higgs, just want to give a shout out that uh, grateful for your research, your work. Uh, I would say you're certainly an inspiration to so many. Uh, and I would say you talk about people who, who look like us, but I would say to all of us, uh, all of you are inspirations. I just want to thank you for your great work. It is so important for us to inspire that next generation, that science and discovery is still important, and it can happen here in America. So thank you. Keep up the great work. Let us know how we can help. I yield back. Uh, thanks, the gentleman. The uh, gentleman surfer from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you for acknowledging my great achievement. <laughs> <laughs> you too, David. All right. It's the um, one time he can wax eloquent. There you go. Oh, that's good. I like that. All right. Now, um, okay, first of all, let us know we wouldn't be on this committee if we didn't believe in basic research. I mean, that's uh, Republican, Democrat. Uh, we all are on this committee, however, we are also members of the House that have to deal with budgets. Now, we have, and it's great idealism, and I happen to believe in limited government, and I believe that what, how we can make sure that government doesn't grow out of proportion is making sure that science develops alternatives so that we can solve vexing problems through science rather than through bureaucracy. So, um, nothing, I, I mean, let me just note, uh, nothing should say that we are not united in that, but. Let me just note that when we're dealing with budgets, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle lament that we got out of the Paris uh, Treaty, which would have cost us billions of dollars. Billions. That was uh, the purpose of it, was to redistribute wealth from us to other countries that weren't quite so well off. Now, whether we like that or not, the fact is that means those billions wouldn't be available for us, for, for scientific research. And so when we're talking about this, let's keep that in perspective, that there are other things that if people are complaining about uh, trying to have to deal budgets across the board, which we try to do, that you can't ask for billions more to, uh, to be spent on, uh, on the, the Paris Treaty and, that, uh, uh, and expect to, to have full funding for these pro projects. Uh, let me ask, how do we get more money in from and this? We, we confronted this with the space program about two decades ago when I was very involved on this committee on that. 
and I and we figured we couldn't put more money in and balance the budget uh, in terms of the space program. And I'm very proud that I worked on the Commercial Space Act, and with that Space Act, we laid the foundation for billions of dollars of private sector involvement in space. Uh, and that was the new resource that we had coming in. Uh, and is there some way that, uh, number one, we can get the private sector, for example, right now, these studies that you do and the, and the information that you come forward with, the new materials that you're talking about that play such a vital role in progress, uh, companies actually utilize this to build products that help our lives, but they also make a big product I mean, a big profit in making those products. Do we have now a situation where those companies that are profiting by using your direct research in some way are paying uh, a payback to the federal government or to the sci our science community? Uh, I, the, the short answer is yes, they, they are, but not as much as they might. Uh, in, in some ways, universities and national labs have... Um, uh, filled in the gap for what used to be much more vigorous and extensive industrial research labs in the chemical industry, in the uh, electronics industry, in the computer industry, and so on. So, you know, I, I think it, it, companies do, obviously, what's in their interest. That's what they're, they're supposed to do. But I think it would be in their interest to invest more in collaborations with universities and national laboratories. Yeah, I, when I was young, my dad took me to uh, uh, that laboratory there in, in Dearborn, uh, Michigan, and it was Edison's lab up there, and it was really a very impressive to, for me to see that. And we went to the also next door to where they were developing new things for the cars. That was privately private funding. And I think Edison's was privately funded as well, come to think of it. Um, should, is there, um, we have to make sure that we do not encourage our, our bin industry to continue to be subsidized like this. If there is a way that someone is using the research, should we not try to make further demands on people, if they're going to make a profit from what you're researching, shouldn't they be paying more then for, uh, uh, for the use of that and instead of having the taxpayers having this as a hidden subsidy? Well, I, I, I think, you know, it's a complicated situation. I, I, don't, uh, I don't think, at least I couldn't tell you what the right formula would be there. I would just express an overall hope that um, well, there would be more collaboration. Well, if we do it for free, we yeah. can't blame the companies for, for <laughs> taking it free. And uh, we have a, a, a patent system in our country. Isn't, couldn't we then, is there a way that we could expand uh, the protection of the patents so that materials that, that is developed in the, pri in the public sector or, uh, uh, or even in the private sector, but mainly what you're doing with public money, uh, that that has to be repaid uh, uh, to the, and uh, the owner of the patent would be the government in that case? Um, well, uh, generally speaking, uh, at universities or, or at national labs, the owner of the patent is the university or the national laboratory, and then licensing fees are, are paid. And Argonne gets uh, millions of dollars a year in licensing fees. So this, that kind of thing is happening. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, I think it's a matter of developing a good system and uh, figuring out if, it's, if the balance is right there. Well, let's see if we can do that. That's, that's an avenue. We shouldn't just looking at, at scientific basic research as simply it's going to be part of the federal bureaucratic programs that we must. Let's see if we can th make things more efficient by making sure that the people in the private sector who profit from what you're doing are maybe paying a little higher share, but also that will encourage them to be doing research as well. So with that, thank you very much for all the good work you're doing, and I certainly wish you success in uh, coming up with a material that's gonna make us uh, cool in the, in the summer and warm in the winter. That's great, thank you very much. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. I want to thank the witnesses for their value, valuable testimony and the members for their questions today. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from the members. I do want to end by saying that this committee and the full science committee obviously is committed to research. Chairman Smith has been a staunch advocate of it, both sides of the aisle. 
And uh, so we look at this budget and we say that that is simply a, a submitted budget, but uh, I'm encouraged that I think we're going to continue to be able to help with the research as much as absolutely possible. We are holding, trying to do a lot of things, spinning a lot of plates. If y'all could quickly come up with the material to make those plates lighter, you know, it would make our job easier. So I want to say thank you for being here today again. You all have, we could have gone on for a long time. It's very, very interesting. We appreciate what you guys do. Um, this hearing is adjourned.